Access your free language gifts right now, before they expire. First, the Talking About Where You Live PDF Conversation Cheat Sheet. Learn how to say where you live, how close or far your place is, and master over 20 words and phrases inside. Two, struggling to remember the words you learn? This one minute lesson reveals all the easiest ways to improve your memory and boost your vocabulary. Third, the top 10 sentence patterns for beginners. If you struggle making your own sentences, you'll need this. This free lesson teaches you the most common grammar patterns and how to use them. Fourth, the top 15 phrases for bad students for the new school semester. You'll learn to say phrases like fail a class, procrastinate, and much more. Fifth, the 50 adjectives to describe your personality PDF workbook. This workbook teaches you the 50 must-know adjectives for personalities, so you can talk about yourself in your target language. And sixth, want an app that teaches you the language through conversations? Download Innovative Language Learning for free for the Android, iPhone, and iPad. You'll unlock bite-sized lessons that teach you practical conversations and get you speaking in minutes. To get your gifts and language learning resources, click the link in the description below. Download them right now before they expire. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Francis. Hi Francis. Francis says, Hi Alicia, could you tell me the difference between these two sentences? I will finish my homework by 8 p.m. I will have finished my homework by 8 p.m. Thank you so much from Belgium. Okay, Francis, nice question. Yes, I will finish my homework by 8 p.m. I will have finished my homework by 8 p.m. So these both communicate the same idea, right? We are expressing with both sentences that 8 p.m. is the point in time by which the homework will be finished. So both sentences express this. So that could be like a time before 8 p.m. It could be exactly at 8 p.m. But both sentences express that 8 p.m. is the deadline. So in that sense, they have the same meaning. They communicate this same idea. The difference between the two isn't so much about the meaning necessarily, but rather when we might say these sentences. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at the first sentence so you can see what I mean. The first sentence is, I will finish my homework by 8 p.m., right? So when would you use this sentence? Probably you would use this sentence if someone comes to you while you're doing your homework and asks you, when are you going to finish your homework? Do you know? You'll probably say, mm, I'll finish my homework by 8 p.m., I think, right? So that's kind of like you're reporting your status, right, to the person in the moment. Mm, I'll finish it by 8 p.m. That's kind of your idea, your estimate at that time, right? However, the second sentence we probably would not use in the same way. If someone came to you and said, hey, when are you going to finish your homework? We probably would not respond to this question with, I will have finished my homework by 8 p.m. That doesn't sound natural. And this is for a couple of reasons, actually. One, we often tend to use that future perfect expression when we're talking about kind of two future points in time, and we need to show the relationship between those. So I'll come back to this point in just a second. Two, you're kind of offering this key point in time as the deadline, 8 p.m. So the person comes to you and says, when are you going to finish your homework? And they really just want a time, right? And you're expressing, I will have finished my homework by 8 p.m. This sort of focuses more on the action that's happening, actually. I will have finished this task by 8 p.m. It sounds a little bit odd for these two reasons. So let's break down the first reason that I talked about. When we use future perfect tense, it's usually to talk about a relationship between a future point in time and another future point in time. So when we say something like, I will have finished this task by this time, it's often because we want to talk about another task or another activity in relationship to that. So here's an example situation where you might want to answer with, I will have finished my homework by 8 p.m. Let's say your friend is inviting you out for drinks and they say, hey, are you free tonight at about 9.30 or so? Do you want to join us for drinks? You might say, oh, I will have finished my homework by 8 p.m. so I can join you. 
In this example situation, it sounds much more natural to respond with, I will have finished my homework by 8 p.m. because you're showing the relationship between two activities. If you just respond with, I will finish my homework by 8 p.m., it sounds kind of strange. It's like you're not kind of communicating that you understand there's another activity you need to be thinking about. So in these situations where you kind of have more than one activity in the future to think about, those are situations in which we would use this kind of future perfect expression to talk about a future deadline. So in this situation, I connected my ideas with so. I said, I will have finished my homework by 8 p.m. so I can join you for a drink. This sounds very, very natural because we're expressing the timeline, we're expressing that we understand the invitation from the other person, and we're also explaining, you know, this is about my timeline. This is my estimate for my activities as well. So this is the reason that it sounds a bit more natural here. So again, as I said at the beginning of this answer, the two sentences communicate the same idea, right? They communicate the 8 p.m. deadline. The difference here isn't so much about the meanings that are communicated with these two sentences because they both communicate that 8 p.m. is the deadline, but rather the difference here is when we would use these and in what situation it sounds most natural to use these. So to recap, the simple future sentence, I'll finish my homework by 8 p.m., sounds much more natural if someone just asks you, like, when are you going to be done with that thing, right? Just a very, very simple report or a very simple estimate. The future perfect example sentence, however, sounds much more natural when you're expressing it in relationship to another future activity. So I hope this helps you understand the differences between these two sentences. Future perfect can be a really tricky tense, to be sure. Just keep in mind that we use it when we're talking about relationships between two or maybe more future tense actions. Thanks so much for sending this interesting question along. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Chathu. Hi, Chathu. I hope I said your name correctly. Chathu says, what is an intransitive verb? Meaning and examples, please. Okay, yeah, great question. This is a very basic grammar point that's very important to know. So let's take a look. So English has what's called intransitive and transitive verbs. There are these two types. So a transitive verb is a verb that takes an object. An intransitive verb is a verb that does not take an object. So what does this mean? We need to break down some basic sentence structures to understand this. Let's start with a transitive verb. I said a transitive verb is a verb that takes an object. So the object means the thing or the person that is receiving the action of the verb. So let's look at a really basic sentence like I ate pizza. We have the subject, the person doing the action, me. So I ate is my verb, past tense, I ate, and pizza is my object. This is the thing receiving the action of the verb, right? So in this case, pizza is the thing I ate, right? So this is a very, very basic example of a transitive verb, a verb that takes an object. An intransitive verb, however, is a verb that does not take an object. So that means we can use an intransitive verb in a very, very short sentence that's just subject and verb. So for example, I slept, right? So we don't have any object in this position. There's nothing receiving this action, the verb sleep, right? So this is an example of an intransitive verb, a verb that does not take an object. Some verbs can be used transitively and intransitively. This means that it's okay to use that verb with an object and without an object. So my earlier example, the verb ate is also an intransitive verb, or we can use it as an intransitive verb. So I gave the example sentence, I ate pizza, right? We could also just say, I ate, and the sentence is okay. What did I eat? We don't know. It's not important in this situation, but we can use this verb in this way. This is an example of a verb that is both transitive and intransitive. We can use it in both ways. So intransitive verbs don't take objects. I gave you one example of a very common one, sleep, and of course there are many others. So for example, cough, like he coughed, or fly, like the plane flew. We don't need an object for this verb. So there are many, many different intransitive verbs, and of course there are also lots of verbs that can be used transitively and intransitively. So I hope this answers your question about what an intransitive verb is, and also answers what a transitive verb is as well. So thanks very much for sending this question along. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Yoon Hoo Jung. Hi Yoon Hoo. Uh, Yoon Hoo says, when should I use 
invitation. Okay, invitation. So we can use invitation for physical things and for abstract concepts. So basically, the most basic use of the word invitation is when someone invites you to something. So like someone says, "Come to my party." You can say, "Thank you for the invitation." Right. So the noun form of invite is. Invitation. You can say thank you for the invitation to the party. So this is just a concept, right? So it's a verbal invitation, right? So if someone asked you, you know, with their words, to come to a party. This is an invitation, right? So we can use it in this sense, just as a concept. We can also use the word invitation to talk about a physical document. So, for example, a wedding invitation is a document. You receive a document in the mail, like usually a very nice document in the mail. That says the date and time, the people's names, other notes, and this is called an invitation as well. So it's a formal way to invite someone to something. So you can use invitation in terms of the concept and in terms of a physical piece of paper or a physical document that requests your attendance somewhere. Another place that you might see invitation used is in calendars and scheduling apps. You might receive like an invitation to join like a Google something, like a Google Meetup or like a Zoom Meet or something like that. You might receive an invitation again. The concept is the same. Someone is requesting your attendance. Someone is asking you to come to this digital meeting. So all of these can be used to mean invitation. Basically, any time somebody says, "Do you want to join me?" or "Do you want to come?", you can understand that as an invitation. So I hope this helps you understand how to use this word in a couple of kind of more modern ways that we use this word in apps and other scheduling tools. So thanks very much for sending this question along. All right, that is everything that I have for this. Week. Thank you, as always, for sending me your awesome questions. Please remember to send them to me at the official question submission page, which is EnglishClass101.com/ask-alicia. That is a very long URL, so please check the YouTube description for the link. Make sure to send me your questions there. Don't put them in YouTube comments. Don't put them in Facebook comments. Don't send them to me on Instagram. I will not see them because there are too many. So please send it to the official question submission page. I will definitely read your question and maybe. Include it in the series. So make sure to do that. Also, if you enjoyed this lesson, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also, check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next time. Bye. Hi everybody! Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Zachary. Hi Zachary. Zachary says, "Hi Alicia. What is the difference between meet someone and meet with someone?" Thank you. Super good question. Yeah, meet with someone. It does make a difference. So let's start with meet someone. We use meet someone in casual situations when we want to get a coffee, when we want to go for a drink, when we want to have lunch, whatever. We will probably say meet someone if we want to use the verb meet. Like, oh, sorry, I have to go meet someone right now, or I'm going to meet my friend for coffee. These kinds of situations that are sort of everyday casual life situations. However. When you meet with someone, it tends to sound a little more official. Like you have a very specific reason for this meeting. So you might say,、mm, "I'm going to meet with my boss later today. I'm a little bit nervous about this conversation," or、mm, "I needed to meet with my roommate about the problems we've been having lately." So when you say "meet with someone," it Tends to sound like there's maybe something serious. There's something kind of official or formal that you want to talk about. They do both mean to get together with another person and talk about things. Yes, but meet with tends to sound like there's something else going on in the background. Just meet someone doesn't have this idea behind it really so much. So if you said like, oh, I'm going to meet with my friend and have a coffee, it sounds like it's a little too much in my mind. If you say I'm going to meet my friend and have a coffee, it sounds much more natural. Another important point, though, is that it's not incorrect to use the meet with pattern in a casual situation. We just tend not to use it as much in casual situations because it tends to make it sound a little bit more official. So let's compare these two sentences. I'm going to meet my boss for lunch, and I'm going to meet with my boss for lunch. These two sentences express the same idea, right? They both say I'm going to meet this person, right? But the with 
example, sounds like there might be something official we need to discuss, and maybe you do need to discuss something official. If you want to make that a little bit more clear, I would suggest using the with pattern. Of course, there are definitely situations where someone says, I'm going to meet my boss for lunch, and there's an official meeting happening too. But generally, the no with pattern tends to sound more casual and more everyday, and the with pattern tends to sound a little bit more on the polite or official side. They communicate the exact same thing, but there's one that has a little bit more of an official feel behind it. So I hope that this answers your question. Thanks very much for an interesting one. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Next question comes from Fernando S. Ojeda. Hello, Fernando. Fernando says, please, Alicia, tell us a little bit about why questions, if they're positive at the end, a negative is attached. And if the question is negative, the question that's attached at the end is made positive. For example, you would like pizza, wouldn't you? Great question. Yeah, this question is about something that is called tag questions. There is a word for this. This is called a tag question. A tag question is a short question that's put at the end of a sentence. So in your example, you would like pizza, wouldn't you? This wouldn't you is what's called a tag question. So in your example, you said you would like pizza, right? So you would, so it's a positive would. And the end, the tag question is wouldn't you, a negative. So we always follow this pattern. If the main part of the sentence is positive, the tag question is negative, and the opposite is true. If the main part of the sentence is negative, the tag question is positive. So for example, you wouldn't be very happy if someone were mean to you, would you? In this sentence, we have a negative in the main part and a positive in the end part, in the tag question. So your question is why? Because this is just the grammar rule that we use for tag questions. We use tag questions for confirmation purposes. In your example, you would like pizza, wouldn't you? You are confirming with the other person that yes, they would like some pizza, right? So this is just the rule that we follow for tag questions. So when you want to use these kind of short, casual style confirmation questions, just make sure that you follow this opposite rule. If your main question or your main sentence is positive, use a negative tag question and vice versa. Negative main sentence, positive tag question. I have a video about this on the English Class 101 channel, so you can do a quick search on the channel for more information about tag questions, how to make them, and how to use them. So I hope that this answers your question. Thanks for sending it along. Okay, let's go to the next question. Next question comes from Buddha Ram. I hope I said that right. Buddha says, Roses smell sweet without an article. An elephant is a big animal using an article. The elephant is a big animal showing the whole race. When do we use a, an, or zero articles to talk about a whole race or kind of things? Which is correct to use? Okay, so let's start with that last point you had, the last question, which is correct to use? It depends on what you want to say. Sometimes you want to be specific, sometimes you want to be general, sometimes you want to talk about a whole group. So let's use elephants for this entire example, yeah? So we have three example sentences to work with. We have, for example, elephants are big animals, no article. We have an elephant is a big animal, right? With the indefinite article. And then we have the elephant is a big animal, which is the definite article, right? So we have these three options. The first one with no article is the most general one. Elephants are big animals. You can use this when you want to talk generally about a group. So this could be a species, this could be a specific category of something. We could do the same thing with dogs, with people, with foods, whatever. So we could say something like dogs are funny. I don't know. We could say something like mothers are really stressed out. Who knows what it is? When you use the plural form of a noun, and this could be a countable noun or an uncountable noun, and you use this plural form, no article, you are talking about something that applies to all of the things in that category or all of the things in that group. So for example, dogs are cute. This means all dogs in the speaker's opinion or the writer's opinion. Or if you say, mothers are stressed out. This refers to all mothers. So when you use this plural form, you are talking about all of the things in that group, all of the things in that category. 
Let's talk about how we use the definite article example then. This one can be kind of tricky for sure. So the definite article example is the elephant is a big animal. Where would you see something like this? Let's say, for example, you're reading about the animals of Africa, and there's a sentence there that says something like the elephant is a big animal, right? You might think, okay, well, does this mean all elephants or does this mean just one elephant in particular? The answer is it probably refers to all elephants. And you might think, well, then why doesn't it just say elephant? are big animals. Why wouldn't it just make a statement about all elephants? Typically, when we use a definite article in this way, it's because we've already introduced that noun somewhere else earlier in the paragraph. So you would probably see this kind of sentence in a situation like this. Let's say elephants are very commonly found in the plains of Africa. The elephant is a big animal. So these two sentences are kind of a common sort of flow in the English language, where we have the more general statement, elephants are commonly found on the plains of Africa, and then we have something that's a little bit more specific. So we're saying the elephant is a big animal. So the plural form is used in the first kind of setup sentence, and the definite article is used to make it kind of more clear, to really drive home, to really emphasize that we're talking about those same elephants we talked about in the previous sentence. So this is a situation in which you would probably see a definite article used. So the elephant referring back to specifically the ones that are on the plains of Africa. So you might ask, well, then how do I know if it's a specific elephant or if you're just doing a follow-up sentence or whatever? I would say the best way to know this is to look for context clues. So context clues means look at the paragraph as a whole. Did the previous sentence mention elephants and now you're seeing the definite article used? It's probably just kind of emphasizing those same elephants that were referred to in the previous sentence. If someone wants to make a specific noun clear, they will oftentimes use this or that, or for plurals, these or those, to make that kind of thing clear. The last one that we need to talk about that we haven't talked about yet is the a uh or an sentence. So like, an elephant is a big animal. We use this when we're not being specific about something, when we're just talking about any old elephant, when it's not specific which one we need to use. So when would we use this indefinite article, an elephant is a big animal? An elephant is a big animal is used very generally when we mean any old elephant. It doesn't mean this specific one or that specific one, just very generally. And we use this indefinite article when the other person might not know about that thing. So for example, when you're reading a story and the author wants to introduce a noun for the first time, they will often say a uh, before the noun or an before the noun. Like an elephant came running towards us. The elephant then rammed our jeep or something like that. So when we introduce a noun for the first time, we use that indefinite article. When we refer back to the noun again later, we use the definite article the. But you might think to yourself, so like why would I not say an elephant is a big animal when we're looking at the example situation? So if you say, for example, elephants are commonly found on the plains of Africa, an elephant is a big animal, it sounds like you're assuming the reader doesn't know what an elephant is. If you say the elephant is a big animal, you're assuming the reader knows what an elephant is. So these little choices show kind of your confidence level in the reader's knowledge. If you're writing, for example, a children's book, however, and you say elephants are commonly found in Africa, an elephant is a big animal, it sounds natural for the children's book because the child is learning animals, right? They don't know maybe that an elephant is a big animal. So these kinds of choices kind of give you some clues about the expectations that the writer or the speaker has for the reader or for the listener. So I know that this is a lot of information that's kind of really, really hard to understand, but one of the things that you can do to kind of get more comfortable with this is just do a lot of reading. So the kind of guideline that we can take away from this segment is that the general use sentence is the one that's in the plural form. So like, for example, elephants are big animals. When you want to be open and you assume that the reader does not know the animal that you're talking about or the noun that you're talking about, you use the indefinite article. And when you want to be specific about something you've referred to before, you use the definite article. So in order, elephants are big animals, an elephant is a big animal, and the elephant is a big animal. So this is a very quick breakdown of articles with a very, very specific example. If you want to know more about how to use articles, I do have some videos on the English Class 101 YouTube channel. Do a search for articles and you will find some more resources there. So I know that this is a lot to take in, but I hope that that answers your question. Thanks so much for sending it along.
Great, that is everything that I have for you this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your great questions. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. That is a very long URL, so please find a link for this in the description. Please make sure to send your questions to that official question submission page. I will definitely see your question. I will probably not see your question if you send it somewhere else on the internet, so please send them to me there. If you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Also, check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next time. Bye! In this video, you'll learn 10 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 2000 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 2000 most common words and phrases in English. Each lesson will help you practice and review what you've learned. We'll also include the previous lessons at the end, because reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard decks, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is... Luggage. 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 Luggage refers to all of the things that you take with you on your trip. When you bring a suitcase, a backpack, a handbag, another type of bag, we call all of that luggage. So some people like to travel with a lot of luggage and some people like to travel very light, which means they don't bring a lot of luggage. Here's an example phrase. Travel with luggage. Travel with luggage. Travel with luggage. Okay, next is bandage. 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 A bandage is a piece of cloth or maybe a piece of glue and some other kind of tape, maybe material, that we put over a wound. We put over an injury to help it heal. So for very, very small injuries, maybe you know things like band-aids, which we have that are like little sticky kinds of pieces of cloth that we can put on our skin to help wounds heal. But if you have a very big injury, you may need a much larger bandage. Like you need to wrap some cloth around a maybe very damaged part of your body, or you might even break a bone and need to wrap a very, very very big bandage called a cast around your arm or your leg. No matter what, these are all referred to as bandages, things that we use to help our body heal. Here's an example. Wrap with bandage. Wrap with bandage. Wrap with bandage. Okay, the next word is patient. 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 So, a patient is a person who receives care from a doctor. So, although we have this word patient, which means someone who is very calm and can wait for things for a long time, the word patient in medical situations refers to the person who goes to the hospital, who goes to the clinic, who meets with the doctor in order to receive care. So, whenever someone in like a doctor or a nurse position talks about a patient or the patient, they are referring to the sick person or the person who needs care. So an example of this is sick patient. Sick patient. Sick patient. Okay, the next word is department. 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 A department means part of an organization or part of a company or even part of a store. So when we talk about a department, it's usually because we want to talk about something specific that we can buy in that section or something specific that people in that section do. So in a company or in an organization, different departments have different specialties. For example, accounting or marketing or sales. And in, say, a department store, you might find different departments departments based on the type of item. For example, the shoe department, or the clothing department, or the lifestyle or home care departments, and so on. Here's an example. What department do you belong to? What department do you belong to? What department do you belong to? Okay, next is accountant. 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 
An accountant is someone who takes care of money, budgets, taxes, and so on. So we can have an accountant at our company, and we can also have a personal accountant. These are people who help us to keep track of our finances, our money, and to help us to file information with our governments to make sure we pay the correct amount of taxes. So an accountant is a type of job. Here's an example. Licensed accountant. Licensed accountant. Licensed accountant. Okay, next is lawyer. 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 A lawyer is a job. A lawyer is someone who is specialized in the rules and regulations of a country or maybe even the rules of a specific region like a city or a state. So a lawyer is someone who interprets or who understands laws. So in this word lawyer, we see L-A-W, which is law. So law refers to the rules of a specific place. A lawyer is someone who understands and interprets those rules. So here's an example expression. Company lawyer. Company lawyer. Company lawyer. The next word is wage. 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 So a wage is the amount of money that you are paid to do a job. So depending on the job, your wage is different. And depending on your experience, your wage may be different. So a wage is commonly expressed as a certain amount per hour. For example, $5 per hour is a wage. Or maybe $10 an hour is a wage. So there are many different wages according to different jobs, experience levels, and so on. Here's an example. Minimum wage. Minimum wage. Minimum wage. Next is piano. 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 A piano is a musical instrument. This is a noun. A piano is a very large, usually, instrument that has 88 black and white keys, and we play by moving our hands in this motion. So a piano can be very, very big, like the ones you see in concert halls, and we can also have digital or electric pianos, which many people have in their homes. Here's an example expression. Grand piano. Grand piano. Grand piano. Okay, the next word is flight number. Flight number. Flight number. A flight number is the number of a specific plane that someone takes to go to another location. So when you make a reservation for a flight, you will receive the flight number. So you can pass that information to someone who's going to pick you up at the airport or to share that information with someone you're going to meet at the airport, whatever. The flight number has the details like the departure time, the arrival time, the arrival gate, and so on. So a flight number is a very important part of your travel itinerary. Here's an example. Flight number 345. Flight number 345. Flight number 345. Next is agriculture. 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 Agriculture is a type of science. So agriculture refers to growing food, growing plants, and even taking care of cattle. So cattle refers to animals that we grow or that we raise for usually uh, meat purposes or for dairy purposes and so on. So agriculture refers to doing things like farming in order to create food products and perhaps other lifestyle products. Here's an example. Agriculture product. Agriculture product. Agriculture product. Let's review. I'm going to describe a word or phrase in English. See if you can remember it. Then repeat after me, focusing on pronunciation. Ready? Do you remember how to say the word we use to talk about our bags and our suitcases when we travel somewhere? Luggage. 
luggage. And how to say the word that we use to describe something we put over or on top of an injury to help it heal. Bandage. Bandage. What about the word we use to talk about a sick person when they visit the hospital or visit a doctor? Patient. Patient. Do you remember how to say a specific section of a company or a school? Department. Department. Let's try the job title for a person who deals with money and taxes for individuals and companies. Accountant. Accountant. Okay, now let's try the job title of a person who knows all the rules and regulations in a country or in a region. Lawyer. Lawyer. Now, let's see if you remember how to say the amount of money you receive in exchange for doing a job or service. Wage. Wage. Another one. What about the musical instrument you play in this motion by pressing the black and white keys? Piano. Piano. Do you remember how to say the number used to talk about a specific airplane? Flight number. Flight number. And finally, do you remember how to say the subject relating to growing food and taking care of animals for people to eat later on? Agriculture. Agriculture. Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 10 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you need for daily conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time! Bye! In this video, you'll learn 10 of the most common words and phrases in English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 2000 Core English Words and Phrases video series. This series will teach you the 2000 most common words and phrases in English. Each lesson will help you practice and review what you've learned. We'll also include the previous lessons at the end, because reviewing is one of the most important parts of learning a language. You can also get the full list right now at EnglishClass101.com. Click the link in the description to access more example sentences, create your own flashcard decks, and finally master English. Okay, let's get started. First is... Infection. 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 An infection is not a good thing to have. So an infection refers to a wound on the body usually that has bacteria or something else bad in it that creates sometimes a very painful experience or it can create something that's very, very unpleasant. So when we have an infection, we need to get medicine to take care of the infection. For example, skin infection, skin infection. Skin infection. Next is flu. 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 
The flu refers to a very, very common type of sickness. Flu is short for influenza, a type of sickness. So the flu refers to just a general feeling of not being in very good health for most of us. We can have a fever, maybe we have a runny nose, maybe our stomach hurts, or we have some combination of these feelings. So when we say we have the flu, it generally means we have this very common type of illness that affects the body, usually for a short period of time. This happens a lot in winter. Here's an example expression. Flu season. Flu season. Flu season. Okay, the next word is trumpet. 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 A trumpet is a musical instrument. This is a brass instrument that can be held in the hands. It has three keys at the top, and the person playing the instrument can control the pitch of the sound with their lip motions and with the speed of the breath that they're using through the instrument and so on. So, for example, brass trumpet. Brass trumpet. Brass trumpet. Next is departure gate. Departure gate. Departure gate. The departure gate is a very important thing to know when you are traveling by air. The departure gate is the place in the airport that your flight is going to leave from. So it usually is on your boarding pass, the departure gate number, and you need to go to that specific gate, that specific location, in order to get on your flight. So here's an example. Departure gate 43. Departure gate 43. Departure gate 43. Next is sociology. 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 Sociology is the study of humans and the study of human behavior. So when we study sociology, we look at the different ways that humans have relationships, the ways that humans have interacted over time, the ways that we maybe communicate through our body language or through our words. There are many, many different factors to sociology, but they all relate to societies and people. Here's an example expression. Study of sociology. Study of sociology. Study of sociology. Okay, the next word is flight attendant. Flight attendant. Flight attendant. A flight attendant is a person who works on an airline and they're the people that help you when you need something to eat or something to drink or when you have a question while you're on the flight. If you need a blanket or if you need some help with maybe headphones, for example, you talk to a flight attendant. Flight attendant can refer to either a man or a woman. For example, female flight attendant. Female flight attendant. Female flight attendant. The next word is seat. 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 So a seat is a place to sit. So you might have many seats in your house. Any place that you can sit down can be called a seat. Generally, however, when we make a reservation for something, for example, at a concert or maybe on an airplane, we have one specific seat that is for us only. So for example, airplane seat. Airplane seat. Airplane seat. Okay, the next word is medicine. 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 So the word medicine has a couple of different uses. It can refer to the study of human health and how to recover from injuries and illness. And the word medicine can also be used to talk about something that we take or that we put on our bodies to help us to recover from an injury. So doctors and nurses study medicine in order to give their patients medicine to recover from things. Here's an example. Field of medicine. Field of medicine. Field of medicine. Okay, the next one is economy class. Economy class. Economy class. 
Economy class usually refers to a specific type of seat or a specific category of seat on an airplane. You may also find economy class on something like a train, perhaps. So economy class usually refers to the most affordable seats on an airplane or on a train. There are other types of classes that you can buy, but economy is usually the cheapest and tends to be maybe the least comfortable as well. Here's an example expression. Economy class seats. Economy class seats. Economy class seats. Okay, next is flight. 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 All right. Flight refers to a couple different things in English, but in many cases, it refers to traveling through the air. So when you make a reservation for airline travel, we usually say, I reserved a flight, which means you reserved a seat on a plane that's going through the air. So for example, boarding pass for the flight. Boarding pass for the flight. Boarding pass for the flight. Let's review. I'm going to describe a word or phrase in English. See if you can remember it. Then repeat after me, focusing on pronunciation. Ready? Do you remember how to say the word for a medical condition when bacteria and other bad things get into an injury or inside your body and cause a reaction? Infection. Infection. And how to say the medical condition that's very common and can affect your stomach, your nose, and your throat, sometimes at the same time? Flu. Flu. What about the musical instrument that you play by blowing into a brass instrument with three buttons on the top? Trumpet. Trumpet. Do you remember how to say the location in the airport where you leave from, the place where you get on your airplane and leave the airport? Departure gate. Departure gate. Let's try the word that refers to the study of human society and people and the way we interact. Sociology. Sociology. What about the word for the person on an airplane who helps the customers on the airplane by bringing food, drinks, and giving other services? Flight attendant. Flight attendant. Now, let's see if you remember how to say the noun for a place where you sit. Seat. Seat. Another one. What about the word that you use to talk about something you take, something you drink or eat, in order to fix a medical condition? Medicine. Medicine. Do you remember how to say the type of ticket that you buy on an airplane that is the most basic kind of seat? Economy class. Economy class. And finally, do you remember how to say the word we use to talk about traveling by airplane, the noun that we use to talk about this type of travel? Flight. Flight. 
Well done! In this lesson, you expanded your vocabulary and learned 10 new useful words. Click the link in the description and sign up for free at EnglishClass101.com to get access to the full list of vocabulary you need for daily conversations. You'll also get example sentences, custom flashcard decks, and more learning resources. See you next time! Bye! Are you struggling to understand conversations in your target language? This video will improve your listening skills using practice dialogues. How do you know if your language skills are improving? Our team of teachers have designed a free quiz to determine your actual learning level. So click the link in the description to get your free assessment and unlock lessons that are right for you. In this lesson, you'll listen to a dialogue with the text. Second, you'll review the key vocabulary followed by the English translations. And finally, you'll review the dialogue with the text again to master what you learned. First, listen to the dialogue with the text on the screen. Are you ready to do the safety demonstration, David? I think so. You think so? Yeah, I just get a bit of stage fright sometimes. Didn't you practice in school? No. My first time was last Tuesday, on our way to St. Louis. I've only done it once before. Oh, don't worry. You'll get used to doing the safety demonstration. It's really easier than you think. Now you'll hear the key vocabulary, followed by the English translation. Fright. A sudden intense feeling of fear. Fright. Fright. Safety. The condition of being protected from harm. Safe. D. Safety. Sometimes. At times. Now and then. Occasionally. Sometimes. Sometimes. Demonstration. A practical exhibition and explanation. Demonstration. Demonstration. School. An institution for education. School. School. Practice. Perform or exercise repeatedly or regularly. Practice. Practice. Finally, let's review the dialogue again. See if you can understand more this time. Are you ready to do the safety demonstration, David? I think so. You think so? Yeah, I just get a bit of stage fright sometimes. Didn't you practice in school? No. My first time was last Tuesday, on our way to St. Louis. I've only done it once before. Oh, don't worry. You'll get used to doing the safety demonstration. It's really easier than you think. This is the end of the lesson. In this lesson, you improved your listening and mastered key vocabulary for everyday life conversation. Don't forget to click the link in the description to get your free assessment and unlock lessons that are right for your learning level. Keep practicing and move on to the next lesson. Are you struggling to understand conversations in your target language? This video will improve your listening skills using practice dialogues. How do you know if your language skills are improving? Our team of teachers have designed a free quiz to determine your actual learning level. So click the link in the description to get your free assessment and unlock lessons that are right for you. In this lesson, you'll listen to a dialogue with the text. Second, you'll review the key vocabulary followed by the English translations. And finally, you'll review the dialogue with the text again to master what you learned. First, listen to the dialogue with the text on the screen. Dude, 
The grocery store is closed. Isn't there another one nearby? I don't know. I've never been here before. Check your GPS again. Are you sure you put in the data correctly? Yes, I am. The screen is marking this part of Baltimore as the endpoint. All I wanted was some bananas. Is that too much to ask? Now you'll hear the key vocabulary, followed by the English translation. Check. To examine, to review, to look at, to look again at something. Check. GPS. Abbreviation for Global Positioning System. GPS. Bananas. Bananas. Ask. To request an answer to a question. Ask. Grocery. Items of food sold in a grocery store. Grocery. Nearby. Near, in the immediate area. Nearby. Correctly. In a way that is true, factual, or appropriate. Correctly. Screen. A fixed or movable, upright partition used to divide a room. Screen. Part. A piece or segment of something. Part. Data. Facts and statistics collected together for reference. Data. Finally, let's review the dialogue again. See if you can understand more this time. Dude, the grocery store is closed. Isn't there another one nearby? I don't know. I've never been here before. Check your GPS again. Are you sure you put in the data correctly? Yes, I am. The screen is marking this part of Baltimore as the endpoint. All I wanted was some bananas. Is that too much to ask? This is the end of the lesson. In this lesson, you improved your listening and mastered key vocabulary for everyday life conversation. Don't forget to click the link in the description to get your free assessment and unlock lessons that are right for your learning level. Keep practicing and move on to the next lesson. Welcome to your 2000 Core English Words and Phrases video series quiz. Each week, we'll release a video teaching you new vocabulary. The following week, you'll be given a quiz so you can test your progress. Click the link in the description. Let's learn and review the words for your test. But if you're ready, it's quiz time. Luggage. Bandage. Patient.
Apartment. Accountant. Lawyer. Wage. Piano. Flight number. Agriculture. Great job on completing the quiz. If you didn't get 100%, don't worry. Just check out the previous video again to review the expressions we covered. But before you go, we have a free gift that you don't want to miss. Use it to expand your vocabulary. Click the link in the description below to download our English ebook with the core 2,000 words for daily life situations. Welcome to your 2,000 Core English Words and Phrases video series quiz. Each week, we'll release a video teaching you new vocabulary. The following week, you'll be given a quiz so you can test your progress. Click the link in the description. Let's learn and review the words for your test. But if you're ready, it's quiz time. Infection. Flu. Trumpet. Departure gate. Sociology. Flight attendant. Seat.
medicine. Economy class. Flight. Great job on completing the quiz. If you didn't get 100%, don't worry. Just check out the previous video again to review the expressions we covered. But before you go, we have a free gift that you don't want to miss. Use it to expand your vocabulary. Click the link in the description below to download our English ebook with the core 2,000 words for daily life situations. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about the differences between the first conditional and the second conditional in English. Let's get started. I want to begin this lesson by looking at the first conditional. So the first conditional is an expression we use to talk about this style sentence pattern. There are a few ways that we can make a sentence that uses the first conditional. So we have part of the sentence that uses the word if, and then in the first conditional, the part of the sentence that's in the same like group that's in the same clause as the if, is in present tense. The verb is in present tense here. Then, after this if clause, or uh, in some cases before, the verb that's used can be in future tense. So that means going to, not going to, will or won't. It can be present tense, so a present tense form of the verb. And we can also use a command in this part. So we use these patterns to describe possible conditions or actions. And when we use these patterns, we're talking about something that has a chance of happening. So there's maybe a possibility that the situation can happen. We can refer to the present with the first conditional, something now, or we can refer to the future, something that's going to happen or something that's not going to happen. So let's take a look at a lot of examples that use the first conditional. First, if I have time this weekend, I'll go shopping. If I have time this weekend, I'll go shopping. So the first part of the sentence is my if clause. So the if clause means the part of the sentence that uses if. In my if clause, my verb have is in present tense. If I have time this weekend, then the second part of the sentence, we call this the main clause, I'll go shopping. In the main clause here, I've used I'll. This is the reduced form of I will. So I will go shopping. I've used a future tense expression. So that means I'm describing a possible action in the future, in this case, because I've used future tense. If I have time this weekend, I'll go shopping. Let's look at another example. If he doesn't call me back, I'm going to cancel the restaurant reservation. If he doesn't call me back, I'm going to cancel the restaurant reservation. So here is my if clause. In this sentence, I'm using a negative present tense expression, doesn't call. I've used doesn't here because my subject is he. If he doesn't call me back, so that means there's a chance the other person here will not call the speaker back. If he doesn't call me back, if he doesn't return my phone call, I'm going to cancel the restaurant reservation. So again, in the main clause here, we see a future tense expression. I'm going to cancel the restaurant reservation. That means if this action is true, or rather if this does not happen, I'm going to do this. So this expresses a possible situation. This is a, a possible situation. The speaker wants to express their plan if this is true. 
Let's continue to the next one. If you mix red and yellow, you can make orange. If you mix red and yellow, you can make orange. This sentence is sharing a fact, yes, but we're using this if pattern to express it. So here in the if clause, if you mix red and yellow, the verb, again, mix is in present tense. If you mix red and yellow. Here in the main clause, you can make orange. You can make orange. So this is a simple present tense portion. This portion is simple present tense. So we use simple present tense in a sentence like this to express a fact, a fact. You can make orange in this case. So we want to talk about something that is always true. We're using it to describe a possible condition or a possible situation here. So if you do this, you can make that. So you might see this in recipes or instructions or uh, just kind of when you're teaching someone something. You might see an if uh, clause followed by a main clause that uses present tense. Okay, on to the next one. If lots of people want to come to the party, we should reserve a big space. If lots of people want to come to the party, we should reserve a big space. Here my if clause, uses want. The main verb here is want, present tense. Again, if lots of people, if many people want to come to the party, we should reserve. We should reserve. So this is expressing a little bit of advice, yeah? So we should reserve a big space. So we're talking again about a future action if this is true. Final example for this one, if you don't study, you're not going to pass the test. If you don't study, you're not going to pass the test. So this uses negative and negative. So if you don't study, again, present tense, yes, just a negative present tense, you're not going to. So future tense, yes, but also negative. So if you do not study now, presumably, in the future, you are not going to pass the test. So this is how we use the first conditional to talk about our future plans, if a situation is true, or to express facts like this. You might also hear it used for commands. Like if he calls, tell me, something like that. So this is how we use the first conditional and how we make it. Let's compare this now to the second conditional. The second conditional looks like this. We have, again, an if clause, but inside the if clause is if plus past tense. So a past tense verb is used here. Then our main clause uses would or wouldn't plus the infinitive form of a verb. So we use the second conditional to describe unreal situations and it's for situations that are unlikely to happen. There's a low possibility of that. So that means something that is not true now and there's a very low chance of that situation or that condition happening. Very different from first conditional where we're talking about possible conditions or possible situations. Also, second conditional refers to the present. We use second conditional to talk about unreal situations now. First conditional is used to refer to the present or to the future. We don't use second conditional to talk about the future. So let's take a look at some examples of this. First, if I had more time, I would play sports every week. If I had more time, I would play sports every week. So here, if I had more time, this had is the verb have in past tense. If I had more time, I would play sports every week. So this sentence suggests the speaker does not have very much free time. If they did, the speaker says, I would play sports. So this would shows us it's an unreal situation. It's like expressing a plan for the future that's not a real future. That's when we use would. So we have to include this. I hear many learners forget would, like if I had more time, I play sports every week or I will play sports every week. We cannot use will or we cannot use going to here because this is unreal. This is not true. 
to match the unreal situation, we have to use would before our verb. I would play sports every week. Next example. If I weren't attending a meeting, I would get lunch with you. If I weren't attending a meeting, I would get lunch with you. Here, weren't. This is negative. If I were not, another very common question about second conditional is using was here, but we use if I were you. So if I was something, something, something is uh, used to talk about the past, actually. I'm not going to talk about that pattern today. If you're talking about the present, an unreal present situation, use if I were or if I were not. In this case, if I weren't attending a meeting, which means the speaker is attending a meeting, the speaker is attending a meeting, I would get lunch with you. So you can use this if you get an invitation from a colleague, like, hey, do you wanna get lunch today? And you might respond with, ah, if I weren't attending a meeting, I would get lunch with you. So if this situation were not true, in other words, my plan would be this. Again, we cannot use will, we cannot use going to, and yes, you can change get to eat. I would get lunch with you. So this would be my plan. Another example. If your mother were here, she would be so angry with you. So maybe you can use this to express disappointment in a young child, like the young child did something wrong. You could say, if your mother were here, she's not here, if your mother were here, she would be so angry with you. So again, the child's mother is not in the situation, but we want to express if the child's mother were in the situation, she would be so angry. So we want to talk about that condition. Her condition would be angry in this case. Another example, if you, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. It would be really helpful if you spoke Chinese. It would be really helpful if you spoke Chinese. So here you'll notice I've switched the if clause and the main clause. In this lesson, I'm focusing on using the if clause first, but it's okay to switch. You can put the main clause at the beginning if you want. It just depends on what you want to focus on in the sentence. So it would be really helpful if you spoke Chinese. So maybe you're going to China or you're in China and someone comments, oh, it would be really helpful if you spoke Chinese. That means the listener does not speak Chinese, but the speaker thinks, oh, I wish you did. It would be really helpful if you spoke Chinese. So that means the other person does not. The speaker just wants to express this other condition, this other situation. Again, it is not true. Next one, last one. If you made more money, you wouldn't be living in an old small apartment. If you made more money, you wouldn't be living in an old small apartment. So here, the speaker is talking to someone else, probably who lives in an old small apartment. If you made more money, so if you made more money means if you made more money than you do now, you would not be living. So that means the speaker is living now in a small old apartment, in an old small apartment. And in this case, we're saying if this were true, which it is not, but if it were, you would not be in this place. You would be in some nicer place. So this is the negative form. You would not be living in this apartment. So we can use it to talk about unreal situations in the present. We don't use this to talk about the past or the future. This is a key difference with the first conditional. So this one is a little tricky, but we often use it just to imagine something uh, that is different from the way things are at this point in time. So if we wanna talk about like our dreams, maybe our hobbies, something we would like to do in the future, we can use second conditional to do that. We can also use it to express like regrets and to make kind of soft rejections in this way too. We can also use it to kind of give indirect advice as well. Like if you made more money, you wouldn't be living in this place. So this is a quick introduction to the differences between the first conditional and the second conditional. I hope that it was helpful for you. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to practice making some example sentences with this grammar, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video.
video. Also, if you like this lesson, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye! Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about differences between reporting verbs. Let's get started. The first verb I want to look at is the verb say, say. So when we use say, we use it for neutral reports of speech. So you can imagine if two people are talking and we just want to communicate the thing that someone said or the thing that someone expressed, we can use say to do that. For example, my boss said I did a great job. So that's just a plain, normal report of information. Or as a question, what did you say? What did you say? So this is the most basic way to report speech. For reference, in past tense, the word is said, and as a past participle verb, it is also said. The forms are the same. Let's compare this to the verb tell. Tell. So different from say, tell is used when one person shares most of the information in the conversation. So it's not like two people are, you know, sharing information back and forth, but rather one person shares a lot of information uh, and then the other person receives the information or just has a few small points to share. So in past tense, the verb is told and the past participle form is also told. For example, my friend told me about a new restaurant, or don't tell my parents I failed the test. So you'll notice in both of these, we follow the verb tell or past tense told with the person receiving the information. So my friend told me about a new restaurant. I received the information, me. Here, don't tell my parents about the fact that I failed the test. Don't tell my parents I failed the test. So this is the person receiving the information in this case. Okay, let's go on to the next pair. The next pair, talk and speak. Let's look at talk first. We use talk when two people are sharing information. Two plus, two or more people are sharing information. There's a conversation happening. Not just one person sharing, but there's an actual conversation. So, in past tense, the verb is talked, and as a past participle verb, it's also talked. For example, let's talk to the teacher after class. Or, I talked with my parents last weekend. Then, speak. Speak. Speak is the same, actually, as talk for this case. So, again, it's two or more people sharing information in a conversation, but speak tends to sound more formal than talk. When we're just describing everyday conversations, we usually use talk. If we want to sound more formal, we use speak. For example, we're going to speak to the manager about some problems. So a work situation, a professional situation. Or, I haven't spoken to him recently, if you're talking about a colleague or someone else uh, in a professional situation. So if you're not sure, should I be more polite? Should I be more casual? If it's a professional situation, you can use speak. Generally though, it's not rude to use talk. You can choose which you prefer. Uh, but speak does tend to sound a bit more formal. For reference, past tense is spoke. Spoke, as we saw, actually I included this one here. Past participle form is spoken, spoken. So please be careful, uh, spoke, past tense, spoken, past participle form. Also, about the verb speak, we use it to express language ability. For example, I don't speak Chinese, or she speaks Korean. We cannot use talk in this way. We must use speak, so please be careful. Final point about this pair, we can use prepositions to or with. Either preposition is okay. I saw, or rather I used to here, let's talk to the teacher after class, or I talked with my parents last weekend. The difference between them is extremely small, extremely small. The difference is like, let's talk to the teacher after class. It's like, we have something we want to share with the teacher, and maybe it feels more like we're going to give most of the information. 
When you use with, it's a little more feeling like together, together. So I talked to someone sounds more like direct, giving more information directly. And to talk with someone or to speak with someone sounds like you're participating together. But really, there's not a, such a big difference in communication here. Okay. Let's go to the last pair then. Hear and listen, hear and listen. We use these to report information, yes, to report things, uh, information we received. So let's look at how we use these differently. We use hear for information we receive with our ears, our ears. And also we do sometimes use this for information we read as well. You read it on social media and the newspaper, other news website, whatever. You can use hear to describe that. Past tense is heard, and past participle is also heard. For example, I heard you got a promotion, or did you hear the news? So we use this just to mean received information. I received this information. I heard you got a promotion. So maybe I actually used my ear to get the information, or maybe I read it in an email. Either way, I received this information somehow. I just received it. That's all I want to express. So usually with our ears. If you want to be specific about written information, you can say, I read you got a promotion, if you want to be specific. Or I saw in an email you got a promotion. You can use that too. But most naturally, we usually use heard. I heard you got a promotion. Let's compare this then to listen. Listen. So again, we use listen for information with our ears, yes, but the key difference between listen and hear is that we use listen when we're focusing our attention on something we're receiving with our ears. So here, you'll notice like there's no face here. We're just receiving the information. With this person, I drew kind of a focused face because we're trying to listen, like we're trying to focus our attention on something. With here, it's like the information just enters our ears. So like, I can hear someone in the other room, or I heard a strange noise over there. So that just means I got the information. Listen is like I'm focusing on the information. For example, let's listen to this song. Or is someone listening to our conversation? So again, the feeling with listen is there's focus, there's attention there. With here, we don't have that. For reference, Past tense form of listen is listened, and past participle form is also listened. Please keep in mind when we use listen, we use the preposition to. Listen to a song, listen to a conversation, listen to your teacher, and so on. So please use the preposition to. We do not use this preposition with here. So this is a very quick introduction, but a quick comparison, uh, a quick introduction to the differences between all of these reporting related verbs. So I hope that it was helpful for you. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to practice making some sentences with one of these verbs, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Also, if you like this lesson, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about phrasal verbs for meetings. I've chosen a few phrasal verbs that you may hear in business meetings or in other kinds of meetings, like at school. I'm going to talk about the meanings of these phrasal verbs, give some example sentences, and share a few tips for how you can use them as well. So let's get started. Okay. First, let's begin on this side of the board. The first phrasal verb I want to talk about is point out, point out. To point out something means to mention something specific. So a helpful image for this phrasal verb is the action of pointing, pointing. So you can imagine using your finger to point and then to point out, like this motion from your body. To point out something means to mention something specific, just as you do when you make a pointing gesture, like you're looking at something specific, you're motioning towards something specific. So when you use point out in conversation or in meetings, you're doing that, but with your voice, with your ideas. So you're sharing uh, an opinion, you're sharing something uh, just with your, with your words, and you want to mention that thing specifically. 
physically. So you're not making a pointing gesture, but you are like pointing at something with your words. So some examples of how we use this. I want to point out a potential problem. I want to point out a potential problem. So this means I want to mention or I want you to notice a potential problem. So again, it's like doing this gesture, but just with your words. I want to point out a potential problem. I want to point out a potential problem. Another example. She pointed out that we may not have a big enough budget. She pointed out that we may not have a big enough budget. So again, she's calling attention to something. So to call attention to something means to pull people's focus to something, to draw focus to something. So she pointed out that we may not have a big enough budget. So she mentioned specifically we may not have a big enough budget for this project. Okay. Let's continue to the next phrasal verb. The next one is set up, set up. You'll notice for a couple, for just a few of the verbs in this lesson, I've marked them with this S. So this S mark means that you may hear this phrasal verb split. So that means uh, in some cases, for some people, they may choose to put words in between the verb and the preposition. So this is one verb that you may hear split. So I'll read the example sentences a couple different ways in just a moment. The meaning of set up for this lesson, however, uh, I've chosen two I want to focus on. Actually, set up has quite a few different meanings, but in the setting of a business meeting or in the setting of another like meeting situation, you'll probably hear it used for these two meanings. There may be a couple others, but these are probably uh, the most likely. So the first one is to create, to create something, to make something. The second is to assemble the parts of something, like to put something together. For example, we need to set up a team for our new product. We need to set up a team for our new product. So this one means create. Set up means create here. Uh, another example sentence, let's set up the new office furniture. In this case, it's meaning to, assembling the parts of something. So you're putting things together, like furniture. So let's set up the new office furniture. As I said, this is a phrasal verb that can be split. So for example, you might hear something like, uh, let's set the new office furniture up. You might hear that. This one, we need to set a team up for our new product is something you may hear, I suppose. Personally, I probably would not split it in this case. I suppose I may split it here uh, for this creation meaning, or rather this assembly meaning. Uh, but again, some people may choose to split this one. If you're ever not sure, just keep it together. It's, I think, uh, easier and there's no chance for a communication problem there. So this is one you may hear split. Anyway, this use of set uh, is for creating things and for assembling the parts of things. Okay, let's move on to the next one, turn out, to turn out. This one means to be the result of something, and we use turn out at the end of a situation. We're talking about the end of an event, the end of a meeting, the end of an agreement, the end of a contract. So we use this phrasal verb after uh, something has occurred, after uh, some activities, after an agreement, after something has occurred, and we want to talk about the result of that thing. So it doesn't mean directly to end, it doesn't mean to end, but we want to refer to the end point of something. We want to talk about the result of something. So let's look at some examples of how we use this. First, the test version of our app turned out to be full of problems. So the test version of our app turned out to be full of problems. Turned out to be full of problems. So here I'm using to be directly after this verb. You may also hear, as in this one, uh, an adjective coming after the phrasal verb. So this sentence means the test version of our app. So we had this test version, app means application, like smartphone application. We had a test version of the app. We tested the app. And in the end, the app was full of problems. So this means 
After we tested it, we found it was full of problems. So this is the nuance that's communicated with turn out. So even though this sentence doesn't say directly, we tested the app and we tried many different things, using turned out kind of shows us that there was some testing, there was something happening there. So this is a good hint as well, the test version of our app turned out to be full of problems. So we kind of link turned out to some kind of like noun phrase that gives us a hint about what might have happened uh, in that situation. So it turned out to be full of problems, full of problems. I mean, there were lots and lots and lots of problems with it. Let's look at one more example then. Our event turned out great. Lots of people came. So in this sentence, our event turned out great. Great here follows turned out. As I said, adjectives can follow this. In this case, I've used to be as well. You can use both. So our event turned out great. So that means this event, whatever it was, it could have been a party, a conference, whatever, that activity happened. So many things happened at the event, and in the end, the end result of that was great. The end result was positive. Lots of people came. So here there's some extra information to give us a hint about why the event was great. So again, we use turnout when we want to talk about the end result of some action or some activity. Okay, let's go on to the next one. The next one is take on, take on. To take on in this case means to accept a responsibility or challenge. To accept a responsibility or challenge. You may also hear this in movies, like maybe superhero movies, when they say like, I'm going to take someone on. That's like taking a person on as a challenge. Like they're accepting a challenge, usually like a fight. So as you maybe just picked up on, this is another one that some people will split to take someone on or to take something on or to take on someone, to take on something. You may hear uh, this phrasal verb split. Some examples. We're taking on some research projects. We're taking on some research projects. So that means this company, perhaps, has decided to accept the challenge of some research projects. We're taking on some research projects. So the difference between like taking on and do in this case, like we're doing research projects versus we're taking on research projects. Using taking on sounds more like there's a challenge related to the situation. It sounds like it's maybe difficult or it's new. Uh, there's some like new responsibility relating to the situation. So both are grammatically correct, like we're doing some new research projects next year, but taking on sounds like it's a bigger step. It sounds like the next thing, or it sounds like the next challenge. One more example, he took on a lot of difficult work last year. He took on a lot of difficult work last year. Here I'm using it in past tense. Uh, the previous sentence used that progressive form, taking on. So he took on a lot of difficult work last year means he accepted a lot of new challenges or a lot of responsibilities last year. So we want to maybe talk about uh, that person's maybe personal development or career development over the previous year. We could do that. As I said, this is a phrasal verb that can be split. So for example, mm, you might hear like something like this used. He took a lot of difficult work on last year. So you might hear it used in that way. Again, personally, I probably would not split this phrasal verb. I would keep take and on together. Uh, I try to do that anyway, just to make sure that everything is very clearly communicated. Okay, let's continue on to the next group. The next phrasal verb is show up. To show up means to attend or to participate, usually in an event, uh, in a meeting. This could be a conference, a party, whatever. To show up. Uh, it could also mean to show up to work or to show up to school, to attend school, to participate in school. Some examples. Our manager never showed up today. So here I'm using it past tense, in past tense. Our manager never showed up today. That means our, our manager never came to work today, ne did not attend work today. Our manager never showed up today. Another one, do you think he'll show up at the party? 
That means, do you think he'll attend the party? So we use show up a lot in cases where there's kind of like some maybe social discomfort, like there might be some shame, or maybe you have a bad relationship with someone and you're not sure if they're going to come to an event. So for example, do you think he'll show up at the party? This might be used if like, um, for example, a previous coworker made a huge mistake or they really, really had like a bad relationship with someone else on the team, but there's a company party. So other team members might say, do you think he'll show up at the party? So that means, do you think he'll come? So to show up kind of has a little bit of a feeling of maybe there's some kind of trouble there or there's some reason why a person might not attend or might not participate. So this can have this kind of negative nuance from time to time. Okay, on to the next one, to take off, to take off. So for this lesson, take off means to succeed, like especially for plans, ideas, new products, new things generally. So it might be helpful to imagine another way of using this phrasal verb, which is to describe uh, airplanes, like airplanes, helicopters, and so on. When we're talking about airplanes and helicopters, we describe this motion, the motion of the plane leaving the ground as taking off. So to take off means like to have enough speed to leave the ground successfully. This is kind of the image that you can think of for this phrasal verb for concepts, for ideas to succeed for plans and ideas. So imagine it's like an idea that is going, okay, you start this new idea and it's successful. That's the idea with takeoff for a concept. Some examples of this. We were thrilled our new product took off so fast. We were thrilled our new product took off so fast. Here I'm using past tense, took off, took off. So take off becomes took off. Uh, we were thrilled our new product took off so fast means we were thrilled, we were very happy, we were very excited that our new product was successful so fast or our new product became successful so fast. So that means there's a short time from the launch of the product to the product succeeding. So it wasn't like a long, long process before the project succeeded or the product succeeded. It was very quickly. So to take off fast. Another example. I'm not sure if this idea is gonna take off. I'm not sure if this idea is gonna take off. That means I'm not sure if this idea is gonna succeed. So that means I maybe I'm not sure that this idea is going to ever be successful. So that's kind of a negative feeling. But take off has like that image of something very quickly uh, or like very, yeah, very quickly like succeeding, uh, like going up. So there's kind of like a big spike, uh, a success spike, you can imagine that. Okay, so this is take off, to take off for ideas, for ideas. On to the next one, rule out. Rule out is a tricky one. Uh, you may hear from time to time in like policy making, uh, agreement making, and discussions about these kinds of things. The meaning of rule out is to exclude or to eliminate or to make something impossible. So the idea here is when you're talking about maybe future, like if you're talking about the future, you're talking about potential situations in the future and you want to exclude potential situations, say no, that's not possible, no, that's not going to happen, you can use rule out to describe those things. So let's take a look at some examples. First, we can't rule out the possibility that our clients will reject our proposal. We can't rule out the possibility that our clients will reject our proposal. So that means we can't assume or we can't think it's impossible for our clients to reject our proposal. So that means it is possible our clients are going to reject our proposal. So this person is very softly saying, there's a chance the clients are going to reject our proposal. So we need to consider this. It's important to consider this. We can't think it's impossible 
that they will reject our proposal. So we can say this nicely with rule out. We can't rule out the possibility. So this, you might see this specific phrase, rule out the possibility that, or the possibility of. So that means we can't imagine there's no chance of this thing happening. So we can't rule out the possibility of, or we can't rule out the possibility that. You might hear that used uh, a lot with rule out. Let's look at one more example. The failure of this project rules out a budget increase for next year. The failure of this project rules out a budget increase for next year. So that means this project failed. The failure of this project rules out, rules out. So we're saying this project failed. Because of that, a budget increase for next year is impossible. So this project failing made this other situation impossible. We use rule out to describe that. The failure of this project rules out a budget increase for next year. Okay, let's continue on to the next example or the next phrasal verb rather. Next is to go over. To go over means to review basic information. You're just looking at like the, uh, the key points of something. You're not looking so much in details. Some examples. Can we go over last month's budget? Can we go over last month's budget? So that means, can we just look at the basic information about last month's budget? So you're not really looking into details, maybe. So this, you might use this to make a request to somebody, uh, and then maybe later you do need to go into details, which is fine. But you can use go over to make it sound like you just wanna take a quick look at something, a basic information review. Second example, we went over the article the magazine wrote about our company. We went over the article the magazine wrote about our company. Here, past tense, so go becomes went, just as we would do uh, with a regular non-phrasal verb. So we went over the article. We went over the article means like we did a basic review. We reviewed the basic information in the article a magazine wrote about our company. So again, to go over something has that feeling of just the basic information being reviewed. In contrast then is this next phrasal verb, go through. To go through feels like you're reviewing information in detail. So if you want to go through something, sorry, if you want to talk about something in detail with another person or with a group of people, it's probably better to say go through it. If you wanna just review the basic information, choose go over. So let's look at some examples here. Let's go through the plan step by step. Let's go through the plan step by step. Sounds like you want to look at the details of each item in your plan. So one by one, step by step, you're going to look at the details of something. So we wouldn't really say let's go over the plan step by step, or I suppose some people would, but to me, go through sounds like it's a little bit of a more detailed look. Perhaps this depends a little bit on the person. In my case, I would definitely say go through if I want to make it sound more like I'm interested in the details of something. One more example, he went through the whole contract with me. He went through the whole contract with me. So whole means 100% of something, the entirety, all of something. So he went through, again, I'm using past tense, go here. He went through the whole contract with me is like saying he gave me all of the details of the contract, 100% of the details of the contract. He explained them to me, like he did it together with me. So not just giving me the information, but together we reviewed all of the details. So go through and go over, very similar, quite similar, and I suppose some people may use them in uh, interchangeably. I personally would say I use go over to talk about basic information and go through to refer to more detailed things. Onward, let's take a look at layout. Layout, to lay out or to lay something out means to create like a plan or a schedule. So this is different from setup. Setup and layout can be used sometimes uh, to both like to mean create. If you're talking about a schedule, you're talking about a schedule or a plan. You could say, let's set up a plan or let's uh, set up a schedule. You could use layout in the same way in that sense, 
but layout tends to be used almost exclusively for a plan or a schedule of some kind. We don't use layout to talk about like assembling things. We use it to talk about making plans, making schedules, um, making, yeah, as we'll see in a minute, campaigns, promotions, that kind of thing. So we need to lay out a timeline for development. We need to lay out a timeline for development. So a timeline means a plan, a schedule of when everything is going to be completed. We need to lay out a timeline for development. So that means we need to create a timeline for development. Second example, she laid out a campaign for her client. She laid out a campaign for her client. So here, this means she created a campaign for her client. If it's helpful, an image that might be useful is to imagine physically using like pieces of paper, like it could be just a small piece of paper, like imagining putting these on a table in front of you to create a plan for something. So you're making a plan, like you're making a timeline or you're making a schedule using pieces of paper on a table in front of you. That's the idea with layout. So you're going to lay something out and usually we use this verb when we're going to show that plan to someone else. So this might be a helpful image in remembering uh, when to use layout, layout. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Follow up, follow up. To follow up means to share or to ask about an update from a past conversation. So when I say to share or ask about, you can say, I want to follow up and give an update. Or you can also say, I want to follow up and ask for an update. You can use this verb to do both actually. Some examples. I want to follow up on my last email. I want to follow up on my last email. So you can write this in an email or you can say this to someone. I want to follow up on my last email. So you can use this actually if you want to check in with someone and like you have an update for them or you want to ask them for information. I wanna follow up on my last email. Did you have a chance to look at the files I sent you? So that's like a request. Maybe you didn't get a reply from someone. Or I wanna follow up on my last email. Uh, something has changed. So you have an update to share. So that just means you're giving an update or you're asking about an update. It depends on the next sentence kind of. Another example. Please follow up with the client tomorrow. Please follow up with the client tomorrow. So that means please give the client an update or please ask the client for an update. So please follow up with the client tomorrow. So this is kind of useful. You can use it to mean both giving and asking for an update. Okay, the last one for this lesson, another one that we can split is write down, write down. So to write down just means to write, usually by hand. When we say write down, it usually means writing something with a pen and paper by hand somewhere. Some examples. He wrote down the details of the discussion. He wrote down the details of the discussion. So this sounds like in a meeting, someone wrote down, just wrote on paper with his hand, uh, the details of a discussion. Second example, can you write down your name and phone number, please? Can you write down your name and phone number, please? So you might see this at like the reception of a conference, the reception area. Can you write down your name and phone number, please? So this sounds a little more natural than please like write, can you write your name and phone number, please? You could use that. But I guess oftentimes when we, when we make uh, this motion, it is kind of with a downward motion, yeah? So I think maybe that has something to do with why we use down. So please write down something. When we're talking about uh, putting things into computers though, we don't use write down. We might say take down instead. Like, can you please take down this information? Uh, that sounds a little more general. We use the verb write specifically when we're talking about using a pen or a pencil, so physical objects to make notes. As I said, this is one that you may sometimes hear split as well. So write something down. For example, he wrote the details of the discussion down or can you write your name and phone number down, please? So again, you may hear people split it, but I, again, tend to use these together. Like if you split these and there's a lot of information between right and down, you might get lost a little bit. You might kind of lose the original intention of the verb, like the um, your original plan, your original meaning for the verb. So I think it's generally better to keep the verb together, keep the two parts of the phrasal verb together. But again, you may hear some people split this one. 
All right. So those are some phrasal verbs that you hopefully will find useful in meetings and in other situations as well. Yes, these phrasal verbs, many of these phrasal verbs have meanings that are different from the ones presented here, but I hope that you can consider this the next time you are in a meeting or, or other professional or academic situation. So uh, I hope it was helpful for you, but if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to practice making some example sentences with these phrasal verbs, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Also, if you like this lesson, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye! Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about some vocabulary words that you can use to give deeper meaning to the adjective hot. For this lesson, I've prepared this adjective wheel. At the center of the wheel is this word hot, our focus adjective. So I'm going to talk about several different meanings of this word and give you some more vocabulary that you can use to be more specific in your writing and in your conversations. Let's get started. Okay, I'm going to start with this part of this adjective wheel. So again, our focus adjective is the word hot, and I'm going to talk about different meanings for it, different senses for this word, different ways to understand hot. So the first one that I want to look at is this part right here. This part focuses on the meaning of high temperature, high temperature. So we use hot to refer to things that are high temperature, and this can be for food or for drink, for objects. It can also be for the weather. So I've chosen a couple adjectives here you can use uh, to talk about these different types of high temperature, hot. First, let's take a look at this word. This is scalding, scalding. So when we say something is scalding, or you might also hear scalding hot, it refers to an object often, and we use it a lot to talk about food. For example, in this sentence, this soup is scalding. This soup is scalding. So scalding comes from the verb to scald, to scald. To scald means something is so hot that it causes like an injury, it causes a burn on the skin. So you might also hear burning or burning hot. This soup is burning hot, you could say. But you might also hear this soup is scalding or this dish is scalding. So something that is so high in temperature, it can cause an injury. That's scalding, scalding. On the other hand, this one, sweltering, sweltering. So sweltering is used to talk about the weather. We use this word when it's very hot outside, of course, high temperature, but also we tend to use it in humid places. So humid, uh, or you might know the word muggy, uh, refers to a weather condition in which there's a lot of moisture, there's a lot of water in the air. So we say it's sweltering when it's very hot, very high temperature, and often when there's a lot of moisture in the air. For example, it's sweltering outside today. So you could describe a summer day with the word sweltering. It's a little more specific, a lot more specific than just saying hot. If you say it's hot outside today, it sounds like, yeah, it's high temperature. But if you say it's sweltering outside today, it means high temperature and maybe there's lots and lots of humidity. So these words are much more specific than just hot. So scalding tells you it might be so high temperature it's dangerous. Sweltering tells you that it's hot and also kind of moist out there. Okay, let's continue to the next part. The next sense I want to talk about for the word hot is spicy, spicy. So we use spicy to talk about food. Uh, I want to introduce a couple adjectives that can give you a little bit more of a specific way to explain spicy in terms of food. So a spicy food is pepper. We have this adjective peppery. Something that is peppery tastes like pepper. So it's spicy, yes, but it has like the pepper kind of spice about it. So maybe you know that there are many different kinds of pepper. You can use it for red pepper, black pepper, white pepper, whatever. Uh, peppery is something that you can use to talk about spicy flavors that come from a type of pepper. For example, the steak is a little peppery. The steak is a little peppery. So that means spicy, yes, and that spicy feeling comes from pepper, some type of pepper. 
Another adjective you can consider is zesty, zesty. So for example, I like this zesty sauce. So zesty is often something that we use uh, in sauces or maybe like in, uh, in toppings for things. Uh, perhaps it might be a, like a zesty oil as well. It tends to be used with things that have um, like some kind of herb or some kind of plant in it with a really strong flavor. So a good example of this might be like salon Cilantro. Cilantro has a really strong flavor. Some people really like it. And when you combine that with other ingredients, it gets really, really strong. So we might describe that as zesty. Something that is zesty uh, could be considered spicy as well. So you might consider something zesty as a spicy food. Some people, depending on their taste. Okay, on to the next uh, understanding, the next way to understand hot. It is this one here, passionate, passionate. So this is a little bit different from the words, uh, from the sense sexy, which I'll talk about later. Passionate refers to doing something in a passionate way or something um, that you have lots of enthusiasm for. So let's take a look at these two words I've chosen. Uh, I've chosen inside passionate, inside the sense of passionate hot. Uh, I've chosen lively and furious, lively and furious. We use these words a lot to talk about events, to talk about discussions, debates, these kinds of things where people gather to do something together. So some examples are, they had a furious debate and we enjoyed a lively discussion after the presentation. Okay, so what's the difference here? These both mean passionate. Lively sounds much more positive. Lively sounds like it's exciting, people are enthusiastic, and they're probably having a good time. Furious, on the other hand, sounds like it's very passionate, yes, lots of enthusiasm, but someone is angry or upset or they're really not happy. So this, they had a furious debate, sounds like someone was angry or people were upset. In this sentence, we enjoyed a lively discussion after the presentation, it sounds very positive. So you could swap the adjectives if you want to and say like, they had a lively debate, sounds positive. Or this sentence, we probably wouldn't include they had a furious discussion. Uh, in this case, I've included enjoyed, but you could say they had a furious discussion after the presentation and it would sound very angry. It would sound rather negative. So when you want to talk about something passionate, an event or a discussion that is very passionate, that has lots of enthusiasm, you can do that with words like these. So positive, lively sounds positive. Furious sounds rather negative. Okay, let's continue on to the next sense of this word. The next one is new, new. So when we say that something is hot, like a hot product, for example, it refers to the product being new. Here are a couple more words that you can use to be more specific about your use of new. First is trendy, trendy. So trendy means something that is recent, something that has come out recently, and that many people are interested in because it is a trend, like because companies or because uh, a group of people have said, oh, this is the item for this season, or this is the popular item right now. So it's a trend. Many people want it because it's popular now. It's the thing to buy now. So that's trendy, trendy inside new. Another word that's useful is fresh. Fresh. So you can use this when you're talking about food, like fresh vegetables or fresh fruits. You can also use it to mean something that is new, something that is new, like a product or a piece of art from someone that has, and it has like this kind of positive meaning, something that uh, is maybe unique in some way. So some examples of this, first with fresh, my favorite singer just released a fresh album. So that sounds like it's brand new, it's totally new, and it sounds kind of positive. It sounds like it's just come out and we're excited about it. So fresh, when you think of fresh for like vegetables or fruits, it sounds really good, right? Like something you want to eat or something that you want to consume right away because it's so new. So we have that same feeling with this kind of fresh that we use for like an album in this case or a song, this fresh song. You might also hear it called a fresh new song too. They might get put together. So fresh has that very positive, uh, that very positive like just came out feeling. 
Trendy, on the other hand, I don't usually buy trendy clothes or accessories. So again, trendy refers to something that is popular just because other people think it's popular. So in this case, I'm saying I don't usually buy trendy clothes. So uh, we use this sometimes to refer to something that is popular at the time, like, oh, that's a trendy fashion uh, item or wow, what a trendy store, something like that. But trendy also has that meaning of like, it's probably going to change soon. Like it's a little bit um, just for the moment. So something that is trendy is not necessarily negative, though many people do use it to uh, talk negatively. Like, uh, that's just a trendy store. I don't wanna go there, it's gonna go away. So you can use it to talk about things that you think are going to disappear, trends or stores or whatever. Uh, but you can also use it just to talk about things that are popular right now. So these are a couple words you can use uh, to more specifically express something that is new. So you might hear hot used in these ways too. Like, mm, my favorite singer just released a hot new album. So you might hear it used in that way. Trendy can refer to music or something uh, that is hot right now could be called trendy. Like, oh, that's so hot right now. That would be called trendy. Something that is hot right now is trendy. Okay, let's go on to the last sense of the word hot. So we can use hot to mean sexy when we're talking about people, when we're talking about maybe smells as well. Uh, so something that is sexy is something that we find attractive. Usually it's physically attractive, though with our other senses too. We find some kind of attraction in something that is sexy. So a couple of other words that you can use to mean hot in terms of sexy here, you can use the word flirtatious, flirtatious. Someone who is flirtatious is someone who likes to flirt or they flirt a lot. So flirting refers to uh, kind of chatting very casually with people, making small touches, uh, trying to make jokes and so on. So you're trying to build kind of a friendly, a little more friendly, like a, like a light romantic uh, feeling between two people. So that's called flirting. When we want to talk about someone who does that or someone who likes to do that, we can describe that person as flirtatious. So for example, he's a flirtatious guy or she's a flirtatious girl. So that means that's someone who flirts a lot or someone who likes to flirt. He's a flirtatious guy, she's a flirtatious girl. So if we, we could say like, oh, he's a hot guy or she's a hot girl. If we wanna be more specific, like why, uh, why is that person hot or why is that person sexy? Maybe we can say, oh, because they're flirtatious. He's flirtatious, she's flirtatious. So that's another way to describe someone. One more word you can think of is the word seductive, seductive. So this one uh, is not as light as the word flirtatious. So something that is seductive or a person that is seductive is someone or something that kind of draws your attention, it draws you in. Like they act, a person might act, or like you might smell something or hear some sounds that cause you to feel attraction. So the idea is this person or this thing is trying to cause attraction to happen. So we can describe a person as seductive, like, oh, she's so seductive or he's very seductive. We can also also describe, for example, smells as seductive, like that perfume has a seductive aroma. So it's like the perfume or the aroma of the perfume causes you to feel attraction to the person wearing it because it smells so good. So seductive can be used to talk about people and things. Flirtatious we use to talk about people. So instead of just saying like, oh wow, like he's a hot guy or she's a hot guy, you could say like, wow, he has a very seductive feeling about him or she's very seductive. So that's a more specific vocabulary word to use than just hot or maybe sexy as well. So these are a few vocabulary words that you can consider to more specifically describe the adjective hot. Of course, there are many, many more words that you can use. You can check out a thesaurus to find some more synonyms. Synonyms means words that mean the same thing. Uh, so you can find a lot more synonyms for each of these senses of the word hot. But I hope that this is enough to get you going. So uh, if you have any questions or comments, or if you know some other words that 
that mean hot and you want to practice making some sentences with those, please feel free to leave a comment on this video. Also, if you like this lesson, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye! Hey everyone, welcome to the Monthly Review, the monthly show on language learning. Where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is how to master 500 words with spaced repetition. If you want to speak more of the language, you'll need to know more words. But is there a best way to learn words, especially if you forget a lot of what you learn? Well, there is. Stick around. Today, you'll discover the problem of learning something just once, the power of spaced repetition learning, and how to learn words fast. But first, if you're looking for new free language resources and downloads, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Talking About Where You Live PDF Conversation Cheat Sheet. Learn how to say where you live, how close or far your place is, and master over 20 words and phrases inside. And second, the 50 Adjectives to Describe Your Personality PDF Workbook. This bonus teaches you the 50 must-know adjectives for personalities, so you can talk about yourself in your target language. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. How to master 500 words with spaced repetition. Part one, the problem with learning something just once. If you're like most casual language learners and you're learning new words, chances are you'll look at them once or twice and never again, hoping that they'll stick. But if you want to boost your vocabulary and say, learn 500 words in a month or two, this is not the best way to do it. And it doesn't matter if it's 500 words, 50 words, or five words. If you learn five new words right now, and one day later I ask you what they were, you'll likely remember less than 50%, maybe one or two words. And in two days, you'll have forgotten them all. Why? That's because we naturally forget what we learn if we don't review. In fact, the rate of forgetting has been studied, documented, and graphed out by the late German psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus, who came up with the forgetting curve, which shows the relationship between time and memory retention. So you can see just how fast you forget. It's a big drop if you don't review. Which brings us to reviewing and repetition. Reading a word or phrase once won't save it to your brain, but reviewing it from time to time will help because our brains are not like computers, but more like muscles. And this is where spaced repetition learning comes in. Part two, the power of spaced repetition learning. Spaced repetition learning simply means revisiting or coming back to review something over time. And the space between each review session gets longer and longer. So if you learned a word today, you can review it in two days, then in five days, then in seven days. That way, you review the word before you forget it, and as a result, you strengthen your memory and remember it better in the long run. But you may think, coming back to review in two, five, seven days, it's inconvenient and no normal person would remember to do that. And you're right, it's hard to do manually. Luckily, technology can do that for you, specifically spaced repetition flashcards, which you'll find in our system. Part three, how to learn with spaced repetition flashcards. These flashcards space words out based on how well you know them and test you at appropriate times so you don't forget the words. And the result is your progress skyrockets and you'll easily master 500 new words in a month or two. Now, how can you use the spaced repetition flashcards inside of our learning system? Find the flashcards in the vocabulary drop-down menu on the site. There, you should already have the 100 must-know words deck. That's the default deck, but you can always create others. Click on Study and Start Session to start learning. You'll get a flashcard with the word in the target language. Click on Show Answer to confirm the meaning and mark it as correct or incorrect. 
Based on your answer, the flashcards will start sorting the words for you. If you know a word and mark it as correct, you won't see it for another two days. But if you don't, you'll keep seeing it in that session until you get it right. So just continue reviewing the words and keep at it until the study session is done, which should only take a few minutes. Once you're done, come back tomorrow to review some more and try to drill every day, because you tend to learn better when you review consistently. You can also review with three modes. One, recognition. You get the word in the target language and see if you know the meaning. Two, production. You get the meaning and see if you know it in the target language. And three, listening. You hear the pronunciation and see if you know the meaning. And you can create flashcard decks from words you learn in our lessons, the 2000 core word list, entries in your word bank, and the words and phrases in our free vocab lists. Plus, there are suggested lists right below your decks to help you get started. The beauty of these flashcards is that all you have to do is put in the time until the words are stuck in your head. Don't worry about rushing or cramming. Just do a little each day, and the Space Repetition flashcards will do the rest. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Next time, we'll talk about how to write a thousand words in five minutes a day, Daily Dose Diary. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. You want to understand real life conversations in your target language, right? Well, what if you could immerse yourself in conversations then listen to them as much as you want, like you would music, and start understanding and speaking more of your target language? Well, you can do all of this with the dialogue track. And in this video, you'll discover how the dialogue track, one, immerses you in the language, two, helps you memorize conversations easily, and three, gets you speaking more. But if you don't have access to our lessons in the dialogue track, then sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description. First, what is the dialogue track? The dialogue track is a quick 10 to 30 second audio track with just the conversation of the lesson. Let's say you're doing a five minute lesson about ordering food at a restaurant. First, you hear a conversation. Then our teachers explain every grammar rule and translate every word. And by the end, you know what it all means. Now, if you want to re-listen to that conversation without retaking the whole lesson, that's where the dialogue track comes in. It gives you just the conversation without any translations. So you can re-listen to the conversation or download to review at a later time. Second, here's what makes the dialogue track so powerful. First, you remember the conversations easier. Just listen on repeat, like you would with a song, and the words, phrases, and grammar rules will stick better. And the more you come back to re-listen, the better it will all stick. Second, you improve your listening skills and can immerse yourself in the language. Imagine you've finished 20 lessons, and you downloaded 20 dialogue tracks to your phone. That's 20 conversations. Create a playlist and play those 20 tracks as you're going about your day. You'll immerse yourself in the language and quickly improve your listening skills. Third, you start to speak more of your target language. So if you have 10, 20, or 100 dialogue tracks like that, then you have 10, 20, or 100 conversations that you'll know inside out and that you can use in real life. And as a result, you end up speaking more of your target language. So if you want to start understanding conversations, take advantage of the dialogue tracks, which are available inside every one of our audio lessons. But if you don't yet have access, sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to sign up. Want to speak more of your target language? Well, here's a completely free way to boost your vocabulary so you can understand more, speak more, and increase your fluency. In this quick guide, you'll learn all about our free vocabulary lists, how you can unlock hundreds of vocabulary lists that we give only to our users, and how you can learn new words and phrases fast without having to memorize for hours. But first, if you don't yet have access to our free vocabulary lists, be sure to sign up for a free lifetime account. Just click the link down in the description to sign up right now. So, how do these free vocabulary lists increase your fluency? Here's how. 
First, you can boost your vocabulary and range of expression with hundreds of vocabulary lists spanning all the must-know topics. Just look for the vocabulary lists inside the vocabulary drop-down menu on the site. And there, you'll find lists for all kinds of topics, such as introducing yourself, talking about weather, the most common conversational phrases, holidays like Valentine's Day, Halloween, Christmas, New Year's, and much more. Second, you can practice your listening skills. By hearing the words at both native speed and at the slower half speed. Just click on the speaker icon next to each word to hear it at normal speed, and click a second time to hear the word at half speed, and you'll easily start understanding the word anytime you hear it. Third, you can practice your speaking skills with the voice recorder, a premium feature inside the vocabulary lists. Just click on the microphone icon to record yourself saying the word or phrase. You can also listen to the native pronunciation and your own pronunciation side by side, that way, you can instantly hear how close you are to the native speaker and how to improve. Fourth, you can easily review the words with the vocabulary slideshow tool. Just click the play slideshow button at the top and sit back and listen to the words. You can also play the slideshow on loop until all of the words and phrases are stuck in your brain. And fifth, if you want to master these words even faster, you can save them to your word bank or study them with the flashcards. Both are premium features. The word bank is your personal collection of key vocabulary, where you can also create principal vocabulary study sheets. And with flashcards, you can drill the words and retain them forever, thanks to our smart space repetition system. So if you want to boost your vocabulary and speak more of your target language, then get access to our free vocabulary lists. Sign up for a free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description to sign up. Great work. Here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description.